sweetheart. Hey. Welcome aboard Pancon Flight 257 to London. Flight time today will be six hours and 30 minutes. I love you. You imagine? Is that going to be you? I hope not. Left behind. How many of you saw that, that movie with uh, Nicolas Cage? I saw it. It was a pretty good movie. One day, in an instant, in the blinking of an eye, the Lord will rapture his church. And my question to you is, are you sure you're going to be in the rapture? I'm your sh are you sure you're going to be, the Lord's going to take you? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, some Christians tell me that, well, you know what? If you're not living right or if you're in sin, when, when the rapture comes, the Lord might leave you behind. Is that true? Well, wait a minute. Let's listen to what Scripture says. Scripture is the truth. It's God's Word, and it's what tells us what to believe, what not to believe, it's our source of truth. Now, last week, I answered the question, is the rapture before the seven-year tribulation? And we mentioned that the tribulation is mainly for the nation of Israel and not for the church, not for the believers, but for the unbelievers for the nation of Israel and for the world, the unbelieving world. Number two, that darkness would fill the earth because the Holy Spirit would be removed. And where does the Holy Spirit dwell right now? In the heart of the believer, right? Those who believe, who have received Christ as their Savior, the Lord says he, they have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when, the, when there's darkness on the earth, it's because the Holy Spirit has been removed but who went with the Holy Spirit? We did. Because wherever the Holy Spirit goes, we go. And number three was, in Scripture, there's a, uh, uh, the Scripture urges an attitude of constant expectance, expectation of Christ's coming. Now, if, if the next thing on the list would be the seven-year tribulation, the expectation would be for agony and suffering and misery on earth like, like never before. But the expectation, the Lord tells the believer to, to, to look forward to the coming of the Lord, to expect it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, and to await the Son or His Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So, and, and we went over many verses. If you, if you want to, you can go back. This is the fifth, uh, this is part five of this series on the rapture. But it says here to wait for the son who's coming from heaven, not to wait for the tribulation, if the tribulation was next, then to wait for a seven, after the seven-year tribulation, then the sun will come. But it's before. And he adds, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The Lord delivers us from the wrath to come. Why? Because the church is God's, the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And the wrath of God, the wrath of God, the wrath of God that was intended for us has already fallen on Christ. Christ already took the wrath of God. We will be judged. 
but not according to our sins, not because of our sins. Our sins will be mentioned no more. The Lord, as a matter of fact, he says he doesn't remember our sins anymore. He doesn't see our sins. He sees the righteousness of Christ instead. And number four, the Lord will choose others to preach the gospel. During the tribulation period, 144,000 will be preaching. And by the way, there will be men, virgins, and Jews. There will be 12,000 from each tribe. And that's found in Revelations chapter 7. And there will also be two witnesses that will stand at the Temple Mount and preach the word. So the Lord, and that's in Revelations chapter 11. And number five, the church will be in heaven. And there's many verses in Revelations that we covered last week that say that the church will be in heaven during the tribulation period. There will be destruction going on on earth, but simultaneously we will be up in heaven with the Lord. And we read Revelations chapter 19, verse 7, which says, let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now, I asked you last week, and I'll ask you again today, have, has anybody ever gone to a wedding where the bride wasn't present? The bride didn't show up? I haven't. The bride is always there, right? Always. The bride. Who is the bride of Christ? The church. We are. The Lord doesn't, didn't destine the church or the bride of Christ to, to go through the tribulation period, but to marry him. He proposed to us. If you were here on Friday, Case mentioned that to us, that when we break bread and he gives us the cup to drink, that's a marriage proposal. That's how the groom would propose to the bride in Galilee in the time of Christ. And Jesus is saying, this is, take this. This is my, the cup of, 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 of the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. Isn't that awesome? The Lord proposed to us. And he says, I will go and prepare a place for you. And I will come back and take you to myself. And you will be with me forever. That is our hope. Not the tribulation. That is our hope. So that answered the first question. Now, what about the second one? Can we be left behind? Can any of us individually be left behind? There's a lot of talk about that, and there's many that say, man, if you're, if you're not, if you're in the world, or if you're, if you're drinking, or if you're sinning, or if you're, you're in some kind of sin when, you're, when, when the Lord comes, you're, you're left behind. Is that true? Let's see what the Lord says. First of all, God always, 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 in Scripture, from Genesis all the way to Revelations, removes the righteous before judgment falls on a nation. Remember, Enoch walked with God, and he was raptured. He was removed. He was taken. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The Lord took him before the flood. The Lord snatched him out. That was chapter 5. The flood came in chapter 6 of Genesis. Remember Enoch and Noah. The Lord saved Noah, righteous, and his family. He, he pulled them out. He said, Made an, make an ark. And when he, had, he said that people didn't know what was going on, they had no idea, they made fun of him. It took him a long time, I think 100 years, to make the ark. And, and they were just laughing their heads off. You know, we've never seen rain, rain. What do you mean rain? Rain has never fallen on the earth until now. He made the ark. His family went in. 
all the animals that, that two by two, they came into the ark. They closed the door of the ark and then it started raining. And then all of a sudden, those people that were outside of the ark that didn't believe, that made fun of Noah, they were washed away in the flood. But the Lord removed Noah. He protected Noah from judgment that was coming upon the earth because he was a righteous man. He was a believer. What about Lot? Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord sent two angels to take Lot and his family and take them out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the wrath comes. You see the examples and the Lord will remove us, the believers, from the earth before the, before the, the seven-year tribulation will come. He's going to do that. The firstborn in Egypt, the firstborn in Egypt, the last plague was the death of the firstborn and those who believed, who took lamb's blood and, and anointed the, the doorposts and the doorway of their homes when the angel of death passed over, no one in that family died. The Lord protected the righteous. He protected the believer. He always does. The spies in Jericho. That's found in, in Joshua chapter 2. The Lord protected those spies. When they were looking for them to try to, to take them to prison and they, uh, Rahab, the prostitute, hid them and they were able to escape before destruction fell upon Jericho and the, the walls of Jericho fell. God always protects those he loves and those that, well, he loves the whole world, but he always protects those who received him, who believe in him, those who are righteous by the blood of Christ. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome news, fantastic news. Now, I mentioned that we are, we are his body. We are the church, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. When you go on a trip, do you leave your arm behind or your leg behind and just go, you say, okay, well, I'm just going to leave a part of my body and go on vacation. You can't do that, right? The Lord says that we are his body. If you are a part of his body, he's not going to leave you behind. He can't leave me you behind. You're part of the body. He was, he's going to take the entire church, the entire body of Christ, will be snatched up whether they're behaving well or not, whether they're misbehaving. And now, of course, if the Lord snatches you and you're in the middle of something shameful, I, it's, a, it's, it's on you, guys. <laughs> it's going to be very shameful. You're, you're going to say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for you to catch me doing this while, you know, because it's going to be in an instant. You never know. Nobody knows the day and the hour when the Lord will come. So God tells us, be awake, be alert, be praying, be serving, be making disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, go preach the gospel, because then you will be Filled with joy when you see the Lord face to face and not ashamed. Verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. We were all baptized by the spirit. When did that happen? In Pentecost. 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, a rushing mighty wind came and the Holy Spirit came and filled, indwelled the believers that were gathered there and connected us one to another. And there, in that instant, the body of Christ, the church, was born. And we are one body. 
connected by the Spirit of God. In verse, skipping over to verse 27, now you are one, you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. You are the body of Christ. Now, I mentioned a couple of weeks back about Israel. They expected a conquering, victorious leader, a Messiah that would deliver them from the iron fist of the, of the Romans, and that's not what happened. They, there was a, a humble servant that came, and, and Scripture talks about both, the humble servant and the victorious king. They had no idea that both would be fulfilled in one man. Of course, maybe when, if we would have been living during that time, we would, we would have probably said, no, it's impossible. It has to do, be two different people, not one. So when he came as a humble king, they, they rejected him. And there's a partial hardening. Now, I know that there are ministries in Israel right now evangelizing. There's one called One for, for Israel, an excellent excellent ministry and we support that ministry by the way they are the, the lord is just using them in a mighty way to reach Jews for Christ there are many Jews and i've been to worship meetings where where they're all Jew, Jewish Christians and it's so special to be with God's people and to worship they many of them have received Christ but the bulk of of Israel has not received Christ and the Lord spoke about that in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. This is a mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. They become hardened until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. What does that mean? until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. What happened to the apostles? They went to Israel and they were rejected and they, then they said, okay, we're gonna go to the Gentiles. The church of Christ, its majority, in its maturity, is composed of Gentiles. Those, us, praise the Lord that God included us into his body and there's a partial hardening by Israel until those Gentiles that are going to receive Christ do receive Christ. God in his foreknowledge knows how many will come to him and how many will receive the Lord. And when that number is fulfilled, when the last member of the body accepts Christ and that body is complete, then the trumpet will sound and we will be raptured. We don't know when that number will, when that will happen, but the interesting thing is that the Lord is waiting. The rapture has not occurred because he's waiting for those who he knows will receive Christ to receive Christ. So, now, if he's waiting for unbelievers who haven't received Christ to receive the Lord, he says he is not slack in his promise, but he doesn't want anybody to perish, right? And all are welcome to receive Christ because we all have the freedom, the free will to accept Christ or to reject him. But God in his foreknowledge knows how many will receive Christ. And when they do receive Christ, that trumpet will sound and we will be snatched in the blink of an eye. And we can say, tell our troubles goodbye and say, Lord, goodbye. Like my dad used to say, goodbye, sweetheart. <laughs> no more. No more trials. No more suffering. No more pain. No more diseases. No more anguish. No more wounds to heal. We'll be restored completely in his presence. I await that day like, like and, and I'll tell you, we are very blessed. We're very blessed here, and I, I receive a lot of blessings, 
But nothing compares to being in God's presence. Nothing compares to that. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we are the body of Christ. Now we're also the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul tells the church, inspired by the Holy Spirit, it says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. Who's that? He betrothed the church at Corinth to one husband, Jesus, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What a beautiful verse. We're betrothed. We're engaged to be married. We accepted. Every time we, we break bread together, we're accepting his proposal. Yes, Jesus, I, I accept. I, 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 I do want to spend my, the, the rest of my eternity with you. We're betrothed to him, and he's going to come one day to get his bride, and our wedding will be celebrated in heaven. That's got to be glorious. I have no idea what that's going to be like, but it's going to be much far greater than anything we can even fathom. We cannot comprehend the beauty, the, the glory, the joy, the peace, the love. I mean, I don't know. It's going to be amazing, amazing, amazing. He, appro he proposed to us, and then he proved his love by giving his life for us and dying on the cross and paying for all our sins. He's dead serious about coming to get us. He's very serious. And one day, it's gonna happen because the miracles, a lot of times people don't believe in miracles because they say, wow, you know, it's been so long, I haven't seen anything cataclysmic, and I see things happen, earthquakes and, and wars and rumors of war, the things that, but something huge where I can say, wow, look what God did. Well, we saw something huge. Those of us, well, I wasn't alive back then, but it was in our recent history, 1948, when Israel became a nation. That was a miracle. That was a miracle for a nation to be roaming around the earth, scattered for 2,000 years, and not lose their identity and come back to their original land and be named a nation in one day. That has never happened before. That was a miracle. And the next miracle, huge miracle, will be when the rapture comes. And God, of course, answers our prayers and performs miracles in our lives. But the big thing where, where the Lord, and you imagine, you saw the clip on that video. What's going to happen? Those that are left behind, pilots disappearing, planes crashing, people driving their cars disappearing, cars crashing, people running around trying to find their loved ones that have disappeared, Chaos and mayhem. And in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says that they, when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will fall upon them like a woman who's in labor. Sudden destruction. I believe that that's when the, the rapture occurs and then sudden destruction will happen upon the earth. I, I read the verse in, in, in Revelation chapter 19 that says rejoice and exult because the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. The Lord's not going to leave his bride or part of his bride on earth. That doesn't make sense. God cannot do that. He won't do that because it's against his nature. That's his bride. He said he wash. In, 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 uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, that, that he washes his, his bride with his word to present her pure and, and blameless without a blemish. And number three, we are part of the church, right? Part of the church. The church is not this building. The church is us, those who believe in Christ. Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, 
you are Peter, and on this rock, I, Jesus, will build my church. I will build my church. The church, who is the owner of the church? Jesus, who is the builder of the church? Jesus. And when he builds the church, he's not going to say, okay, well, I'm going to leave it here to get, this, to get all torn up in the tribulation. I'm going to snatch the church up to be with me. If you are part of the church. In the book of Revelations, chapter 1 through 3 are the seven letters to, to the seven churches. In chapter 4, suddenly John sees an open door in heaven and the voice of someone that spoke, spoke to him like a trumpet and he said, come up here and I'll show you what's going to occur after this. After that verse, no more mention of the church in the entire book of Revelation. There's mention of the church in heaven, but not mention of the church on earth. And the Lord mentions multitudes standing before the throne, dressed in white linen, worshiping, holding palm branches. That's us in heaven, not on earth, not on earth. We are part of the temple of the Lord. And I wanted to, to mention this in Hebrew, in, um, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that awesome? We're members of his family. Does God kick his family out, his sons and daughters out? No. He doesn't do that. He doesn't kick them out. He tells them, come here, let me discipline you when you dis misbehave. Yeah, he disciplines us, but he does not kick us out. The Lord will not kick his children out. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So he talks about the building made of Real life stones. He is the cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom the whole structure, the church, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The Holy Spirit indwells us all and created the church. In him, you also are built together, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The Spirit is continually building the church, building the church, building the church, building the church. So if the Spirit builds the church, does it make sense for Jesus to leave part of the church down down? Uh, and, and left behind, leave part of the church behind? No. He takes the entire church with him. Or do, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Within you, the Holy Spirit is inside of you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. He's bought us with a price, with his own blood. In the slave market, we were slaves of sin and slaves of the devil. And the Lord, with own, his own blood, he bought us and set us free. And we are connected. Now, I think that this fourth point and the last point I'm going to mention is is probably the most convincing of all that we will not be left behind. We have been sealed with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't only come and to live in us, but the Lord sealed us. Now, in the times of the Romans, Caesar would place a seal on a letter. They placed a seal on the rock that was rolled in front of the tomb of Jesus. Who can break that seal? 
Only Caesar himself, by order of Caesar. Nobody, if anybody dared to break that seal, their head was coming off. You cannot break a seal by the emperor of Rome. You cannot. Now imagine God placing a seal. Who can break a seal placed by God? Who can do that? Who has the authority to do that? We don't. Who has the authority? Who has the power to break a seal placed by God? No one except God himself. In chapter 5 of Revelations, when, when the, the, the scroll with the seven seals was, was given, was, was there, and uh, John says he cried because he said no one was found that could open the, the, the seven seals. And, and the angel told him, don't cry, because the lamb that was slain, the lamb that gave his life for us, he has the authority to open those seals. He's the only one that has the authority to break the seal that is in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That seal cannot be broken. So that means that if you go to heaven, if the Spirit goes to heaven, you go to heaven. If the Spirit goes to hell, you go to hell. If you were able to lose your salvation, the Holy Spirit would have to go to hell with you because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, notice, believed in him. That's all you had to do, believe in him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The moment you believe, oh, wow, I realize now that my good works will never be enough to earn heaven. I put all my trust in Christ. The moment you do that, God says that he, you were born again, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that seal will not be broken. For all eternity, the Spirit will be dwelling in you. And in verse 14, it says, who is? This seal, the Holy Spirit, is the guarantee of our inheritance. He's giving you a guarantee. Hey, I am going to take you. I'm coming to get you. And I'm not going to leave you orphans, Jesus said in John 14. But I'm going to send the comforter to be with you, which will be with you and will be in you. That's the Holy Spirit. He sent the guarantee. We, we have a guarantee. Not, God doesn't have to guarantee anything. His word is enough, right? But on top of that, he says, I'm going to give you an, a, a guarantee. Just so that you'll be sure, absolutely sure, dead sure, that you will be raptured, that you will be with the Lord, that you're not going to have to go through those seven years of tribulation. The guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, until you're finally there in heaven to the praise of his glory. Amen. Praise him. Praise him. He is glorious. Look at what he's done for us. Now, we saw last week that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that there's something holding back the spirit of, of, of the wicked one, the, the mystery of lawlessness and the, the antichrist. There's something holding him back, someone holding him back. And that's the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is removed, it says that he cannot manifest himself, the Antichrist cannot manifest himself until the Spirit is out of the way. Well, you know what? When the Spirit is out of the way, so are we. And we're going to be there celebrating with the Lord. That is awesome, awesome, awesome. So, what is the requirement? And I think I answered the question. What is the requirement 
for being rapture ready? What is the requirement for being ready to be snatched up? The only requirement, living right, obeying the law, no. And let's see the verse right in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The famous chapter where the rapture is mentioned. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 13, it says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have passed away. Many times scripture mentions when a believer pass, uh, passes away, he fell asleep because he's not dead. He's with the Lord. He's eternal. He's living forever. And those of our loved ones that have passed away, they're, they haven't, they're not lost. They haven't passed, they, they haven't died. They're in the, the presence of the Lord. I don't want you to be in, uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, as others do who have no hope. Listen to this. For since we believe. Let me read it again. So since we believe. So since we believe. That's all it says. Believe. Just believe. Believe what? Well, the rest of the verse continues and it tells you. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We believe. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, the gospel. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. If we believe, if we believe, that's all it takes. Let me tell you a secret. That's all it takes. Believing, that's it. No, but that's too easy. No. The reason believing is the only way Believing in Christ is because none of us have the perfection needed to enter heaven. Anybody perfect here? Please raise your hand. Good, 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 because we're not a perfect church, so we all blend in. You know, you'd be a little bit out of place if you were perfect. No one is perfect. No one. Heaven is perfect, but we are not. And as hard as we try, we can never achieve perfection. And the Lord says clearly in Revelation 21, 21.7, 21, that no, no ungodly thing, no, no, no one who sins can ever enter heaven. That's why Jesus died on the cross and he paid for all our sins. And if we receive Christ as our Savior, if we say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I don't deserve heaven, but I believe that you died for me and I trust only in you. Some people say, oh, no, I'm going to trust in Christ. But you know what? Just in case, I'm going to do a bunch of good works here. I'm going to trust in both. Just in case, I'll have a backup. That's not faith. That is not faith. Faith is believing only in Christ. Water. I use this illustration often. This is a bottle of water. It's purified water, drinking water. Now, if I add something to this water, is it still going to be water? No. It's not going to be water. If I add coffee to it, it's going to be coffee. If I add uh, lemon, it becomes lemonade. If I add tea, it becomes tea. It changes. God wants our faith to be like this bottle of water, pure. If we add works to our faith, it's no longer faith. Only faith. Jesus is your parachute. If you jump out of a plane, please, use a parachute. Anybody here who's jumped out of a plane and didn't use a parachute? They wouldn't be here to talk about it. <laughs> They wouldn't be here to talk about it. So if I jump off a plane and I, and I have my parachute and I say, just in case, 
I'm going to flap my arms to make, you know, just to, 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 to help the parachute. Isn't that ridiculous? Is that going to do anything? No. Our works are like flapping our arms. We need to hold on to the parachute, with it, which is Jesus, which is Jesus, which is Jesus. I'm going to leave you with one last verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves. And as we see the rapture approaching, as we see the, the tribulation coming, I want to challenge all of you to examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Am I really a believer? Only you can answer that question. Only you. Nobody can answer it for you. Am I really a believer? Am I... Am I really saved? Are my sins really forgiven? Am I sure <clears throat> that I'm going to heaven? We need to test ourselves and be sure because that's the only thing that, that, will, that, will, that is required for the rapture. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Are you sure that Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 16, says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are believers. The Holy Spirit bears witness. It tells us, it gives us the assurance. I am sure I'm spending eternity with, heaven, in, in God, with God in heaven. I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure. Because I'm good, no. Because Christ died for me and I trust his payment on the cross. And I'm sure, I'm sure because the Holy Spirit gives me that assurance in my heart. Now, does he give you that assurance? If he doesn't, I have good news for you. You can receive Christ right now. As a matter of fact, let's pray. Let's pray for a minute. If you are not sure if you're going to spend eternity with God, if you're not sure, if you think you might be left behind when the rapture occurs, pray this prayer with me. Repeat after me. God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I don't deserve heaven, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid for all my sins. I receive Christ as my Savior. Thank you for giving me eternal life and for forgiving all my sins. If you prayed that prayer with a sincere heart of faith and you really put your trust in Christ, God tells you that today was your day of salvation, that you have been born again and that you are part of the family of God now and that you have a lot of brothers and sisters those that have believed are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for, for your word. Thank you for your promise. Thank you that you're not slacking your promise, but you're waiting for those who will receive you. Lord, we pray that you help us, Lord, to speak up and to share the gospel with others, Lord. Pray, Father, that you help us, Lord. Pray that you send laborers to the harvest. And I pray for those who, who, who just prayed with me, either online or, or, or here present, Lord, that you bless them, that you sanctify them according to your word, that you, you, you give them the desire to read your word. The Gospel of John is a great place to start, to read chapter one, one chapter a day. In 21 days, they've read it. Lord, I pray that they would grow and they would get close to you and, and they would just mature and that you would use them in a mighty way and just bless their lives and their families. We pray this, Lord. And thank you that you're coming soon. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for what you did for us on the cross. You are our Savior. You rescued us. We thank you, Jesus.
and we praise you. Give us a great afternoon together. Bless this time of fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you guys. And we are, evan well, let me see. We might not be evangelizing tomorrow. We'll see. It's a holiday, so I'll give you guys a, a break. Well, God bless you guys, and we'll see you on Wednesday.